Professor Howard Williams takes you on a journey through time and space, exploring death and memory, past and present. Archeo death. Hello, so in the first part of this uh, two-part talk on what's Watts Dyke, I try to explore what Watts Dyke was in the late 8th and early 9th centuries AD, when the Mercian Kingdom, the most powerful kingdom in Britain, uh, was expanding westwards and delineating its core territories and its new, newly consolidated territories with a new frontier against the Welsh kingdoms, uh, Offa's Dyke, and seemingly either at the same time or just after they constructed a second monument called Watts Dyke in the northern stretch running and connecting the Vunwy and the Morder stream uh, and therefore the Middle Severn uh, catchment with the D estuary and in so doing it either um, supplemented or succeeded Offa's Dyke in the northern territories perhaps under King Cunwulf of uh, Mercia tried to suggest that rather than being a border or a military defence on its own, uh, uh, Watts Dyke seems to have served as a part of a complex frontier zone um, that had military and peacetime functions to control movement, and trade and communications um, that allowed a uh, north-south traversing of the land communication between the D and the Severn um, also allowed um, to, uh, control over maritime trade out into the Irish Sea and via the Severn down to the Bristol Channel and also may have been as well as defending from Welsh raiding may have been used for offensive attacks westwards into Wales. So in all those ways put together Watts Dyke is a monument that have had multiple functions and multiple significances and it may have been more than Offa's Dyke in the north a, a monument of enduring significance at least through the 9th and perhaps even into the 10th and 11th centuries um, and we looked at Margaret Hurthington Hill's work and the suggestion that the Watts Dyke still divided between a high dated and unhigh dated manors at Doomsday in, t Doomsday in 1086. So there's, there's some possible legacy there for the monument, even though we don't know for sure how long it was actually used for. And we've lost much of the flesh on the bones, the watchtowers, the beacons, the roads or tracks, the settlements and forts that may have been part of the broader frontier. Now that's one side of thing, and now I want to move on to think about the Watts Dyke's heritage and its public archaeology today. And it's important to say that first of all, uh, Watts Dyke, because it's so perhaps overshadowed by Offa's Dyke, and Offa's Dyke in turn is overshadowed by the Antonine Frontier and Hadrian's Wall, it, it perhaps is not understood and appreciated as much as it should be, um, because it runs through the lower lying territories of um, the western, northwestern Shropshire and um, Wrexham and Flintshire, as opposed to Offa's Dyke. Much more of it has been damaged by conurbations, uh, development, uh, farms, villages and towns. So it's, it's been gobbled up and destroyed more and therefore lo doesn't look as impressive in many locations. And yet still it has been the focus of or part of a broader set of campaigns about the meaning of heritage and the meaning of borderland identities and communities in the 21st century. And I put up this first slide to make a point because here we have an image for, um, been, that has been recently used in the Offers Dyke uh, um, Association newsletter uh, to report on the ongoing campaign by Hands Off Old Oswald Street Hillfort to protect the Hillfort and its setting from development. Now I don't want to get into the details of that decade long campaign but to make the point that one of the successes of the project or the campaign by local people and professional archaeologists too and it's had a national voice in relation to um, a lot of uh, 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 the Council for British Archaeology and a lot of other um, major institutions and heritage institutions and organisations have come behind the protection of Old history, not only because it's an Iron Age hill fort, but because of the biography of the monument and because Watt Stike ran into them and out of the monument. So this is looking southwest. So to the right over here is in, is is what becomes it, it stays Welsh territory, and this area is the sort of 
mercy inside, if you so so to speak. Now, so as well as being a striking Iron Age hill fort, it is also a focus of campaign and uh, protest. Um, but the, the challenge of Offer, uh, Watts Dyke and Offers Dyke is that in many places you cannot see them. This is just the section north of Watts, um, Old Ossestry Hill Fort, which uh, is publicly accessible. There's a footpath running um, across the field and up over there. Um, but um, you can't really see it from the hill fort. There's no, it's not marked from the hill fort. And it just looks like a modern field boundary, when in actual fact that hedge and those trees are overlaying a massive slumped bank and in the foreground in the field a filled in still in this section at least a depression of the ditch so it's hidden in plain sight and while there's been some as I mentioned in the previous video there's been some recent field work which has involved public access uh, um, and this is Erdig Hall a National Trust property from two years ago um, published by uh, Paul Belford of Clue Powers Archaeological Trust last year in the Offers Dyke Journal, um, where the, the surviving sections of the monument in the parkland have, um, are associated with areas where the, the monument has been completely destroyed because of 18th, 19th century landscape design. And so excavation works were conducted to test the location of the, the linear earthwork and indeed they found it so despite it the surface traces gone they found traces of the bank and a monumental ditch and to vol local volunteers as well as visitors had a chance to see this excavation going on but still very few will have and indeed one of the bl curses of Watts Dyke is it runs through conurbations but that is also a blessing too because the monument sits very close to large numbers of people so this is in uh Garden Village in Wrexham, where you're looking at the line of Watts Dyke running beneath and built over by garden back fences and walls, and the Snicket runs up from a ditch into the bank. And this is a view from the top of the bank looking down. And most people, I would imagine, don't realise it's there, but um, the, the potential of engagement with a monument that sits right in the middle of housing estates is striking. Um, up and down Watts Dyke, there are various sites which have attempted at various times under various auspices to communicate the story of Watts Dyke, from Basingwork Abbey in Greenfield, the Greenfield Valley, uh, the Beaufort Park Hotel, Hope, Wrexham Museum, Wrexham Cemetery, Erthig, Ruaben, Gaboa, and Old Ossestry Hill Fort and Mile Oak Industrial Estate. So they're some of the key sites I'm going to be talking about. And I've recently co completed a review of the, the heritage interpretation and public archaeology of Watts Dyke. Remember, this is our third biggest ancient monument in the UK, and it's our second biggest early medieval linear earthwork. And so it's, this story is important, and yet actually what I would argue is it's a very fragmented and confused and often out-of-date story. There's no maps there's only there's a walking trail, the Watts Dyke Way, and that's uh, that that's been established for over two decades. But that doesn't often show you the monument, and it doesn't often go along the monument. Um, this is one section south of uh, the castle. This is a Cadu map from the Helen Burnham's uh, guide to the archaeological sites of Cluid and Powys. Uh, the problem is, um, I don't think anyone's going to really understand from this map or from the text really the character of the monument, even though the Watts Dyke Way follows on it from Middle Sotley right the way down to Pentra of Cloth, uh, Cloth and um, down past Ruaben. So the monument is walked upon in long stretches in some places, invisible in other places, but in, in, in all the locations um, the archaeological story isn't really told by maps and guides. This is one of the most prominent locations where you can visit uh, Watts Dyke. It's actually under graves, under 19th century graves. So this bank rising up here is the bank of Watts Dyke, and the ditch is presumably where the path is, but has long been covered over. And these graves, this formed the barrier, the perimeter of uh, Wrexham Cemetery, from the establishment of the cemetery, I think it was in the 1870s, through to the present day. Um, but there's, there's not much there in, in that piece of trace. Um, to, to make people fully aware that this isn't a piece of landscape bank. So there, there's a struggle of do people are people aware of what they're looking at. Um, there are a series of heritage boards up and down the monument uh, created at different points. What Dyke, what, when, why um, at uh, Mile Oak uh, is built at, at the site of the excavations that took place there in the late 90s and 
produced radiocarbon dates suggesting the monument was 5th century in date, which we no longer really uh, accept. And at least there's a there's a map showing you the monument and a little bit of text now outdated suggesting it dates to that sort of immediate sub-Roman period. Another heritage board that's near impossible is completely overgrown and dirty and covered by um, vegetation in near Rewaban. Um, and we have this, this is the one artwork or monument, it's not really art, it's a monument on Watts Dyke. And this is put up to mark a housing estate. Um, so when they were building the house, housing estate 25, 30 years ago, I think it was, um, it says uh, um, Watts Dyke, a 88th century Saxon Welsh frontier, giving the impression this is a borderline between ethnic groups and it is, is, is a... Is, is, is 8th century, which is what we saw Cyril Fox had argued on very little evidence, but associated it as a, a, a preliminary monument to Offa's Dyke, or perhaps of Ethelbold. And actually, when I've been here, sometimes it's completely obscured by that laurel hedge that sort of wraps around it, so it's not clear what it is, but there's the hedge um, down here. At Hope Church, there is a heritage trail around the vicinity, very nice board, but very little about Watts Dyke, and certainly no explanation of what Watts Dyke is. Outside Wrexham Museum, there's a heritage board showing you Watts Dyke running around the western edges of the town in relation to the 13th century charters and uh, records, but no indication of what Watts Dyke is. Um, at the Greenfield Valley, a wonderful, rich uh, leisure amenity and anim animal farm. There's 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 um, some working farm. Sorry, there's a um, beautiful trails and industrial archaeology heritage signboards, uh, and of course the Cadu managed uh, ruins of Basingwork Abbey are right next door. Uh, but unfortunately, there's nothing on the plan about this very imprecise hashering telling you where, what where what Stike is, and there's nothing telling you uh, about that. And a lot of the criticisms I have here are not simply of the interpretation panels but the fact there's no digital backup for resources. Um, when we move into estate lands and national trust property this particular section of what Stike has benefited from local volunteers clearing the massive monument of vegetation uh, and yet there's no archaeological interpretation so the heritage board at Erthig Mott um, tells you about the Norman Mart, but tells you scarcely anything about Watts Dyke, which runs into it. Um, this may have been a prehistoric promontory fort, reused by Watts Dyke, and then they built, a, 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 in the 11th and early 12th centuries, they built an earthen timber castle over those remains. Or, um, it's it at least... Um, you know, if there wasn't an Iron Age phase, then at least it's a Watts Dyke, and then later centuries, when it's redundant, a castle is built on top here. But the heritage boards around the Earthly Estate, while very denoting disability access and so on, don't tell you where to see the dyke. And the same goes with the online heritage. Back in Wrexham Cemetery, this is fascinating because their, their cemetery plan does meant show off a Watts Dyke, um, and it's actually also marked out on the ground. This is the only place where on either side of the monument, on the Welsh facing side, it says what uh, what cloud. On the English side, it says what's dyke. So they they are, it's about the direction you're looking at uh, in relation to ethnicity. And while it perpetuates that this is an ethnic linguistic barrier, which is not necessarily the case, it does allow visitors to experience the monument on the ground. That's the only place where that happens. Is ironically in a cemetery where. Vistas ascends the monument have been sort of difficult to apprehend because the monument is hidden from view. The one English heritage site on the line of Watts Dyke is at Old Oswestry Hillfort, and the main Hillfort sign does tell you that Watts Dyke's there, but not on its northern side. The southern side has a heritage board which is now a bit out of date but is generally okay showing you where we are and the excavation photograph and there's the Chris Musson photograph I was I was telling you about earlier in the first half of the course showing the potential that Watts Dyke continued out um, but the location on the I think third rampart up I, I lose count of my ramparts at Oswestry um, maybe this was once a, a vantage point with which to look over the monument, but now with vegetation growth, you know you can't see the Watts Dyke from where the interpretation panel is. This is in many ways the best and worst at Beaufort 
Park Hotel in Flintshire where this manicured bit of the dike sits in front of the hotel and there is a heritage board here um, and, and one level it's, it's very good because this is a location where you can see the monument without ambiguity and you have an explanation of it. Unfortunately the board is a little bit dated it deploys this style to animal art sort of running border and has two individuals um, that, that, that well Let's just say there's a degree of stereotyping of the Welsh and the English here that, that is a bit troubling. And there's also some um, you know, limited stylized mapping which doesn't really help you to understand uh, how the monument worked. But at least it's in a protected location for all its strengths and weaknesses. The Gaboan signboard about Watts Dyke uh, on, on the site of the former excavations that uh, Malam and Hayes produced is fascinating. It's a reworking of an image at the centre from the Cambridgeshire Dykes, but it does show sort of um, it, it serves in general terms. There's an isometric reconstruction so you can understand it and the colouring showing the layers and, and also the map of Britain. Um, and, and I like that, but the problem is, I was going to say, you, you can't actually see the monument very easily at this location. So you've got a wonderful heritage board, but nothing to really look at. It's also important to recognise that Watts Dyke has permeated out into the broader landscape. So we have two primary schools, and now one with a name change, so it's only one, but there have been two primary schools named after Watts Dyke. So they're at the top, Watts Dyke um, Pat Primary, and associated with that there's a park um, but also a series of road names the parks in Minnesota Isa um, the road names Watts Dyke Way and uh, here's various street names associated with Watts Dyke but also Offer is associated with Watts Dyke in the place name so in the in the street name so you have Ford Offer as well as Bod Offer as well as Mercy Drive Mer Mercy and Drive as well as Tier Watt, Watts Dyke Avenue and Englefield Crescent. Englefield being the English name for Tegain or that coastal sort of early medieval territory that may have never really had its own independence for long. So Watts Dyke offers unparalleled opportunities for visitors to see it if only they were had some guidance of how to see it. So this is and the educational potential of this is huge. So here's Watts Dyke Primary School with Watts Dyke running in front of it. This is a reconstructed bit of the dyke uh, by the Premier Inn um, in central Wrexham. And there's the railway line on the left. So it's sandwiched between a Premier Inn and the railway line. And this line, informed by archaeological investigation, but largely fictional, does try to sort of evoke the presence and character of the form of the, of the, of the monument. Now, all of that is... Um, is very interesting but the, the fact remains that there's an untapped potential a series of very old resources with no coherent design or vision um, going into the interpretation of Britain's second largest early medieval monument which I think is is just not good enough and as part of the office like collaboratory work since 2017 to promote research and dialogues uh, uh, into, by, between historians and uh, place name experts and so many other uh, individuals with the story of Offers Dyke and Watts Dyke, we've set up the Offers Dyke Collaboratory with website, uh, events and meetings, an open access journal I'm editing, co-editing, and new projects. So for example, the, we have a collaboratory website and there's also, I'm going to put some more stuff increasingly on the YouTube channel I run, but we've got uh, over 130 blog posts, details of the conveners if you ever need to get in touch, a list of members simply to show there's a broader community, there's no cost or obligation to be to, you know, involved in any way. Um, and also an archive of the key events. I think that'd be really sensible to set up and that needs to be done in the future. And of course documents and resources are there to the best of our ability but you, you, know, you, you, have, you have to ask if there's any or tell us if there's any problems. We've also held meetings, a whole host of meetings that have taken place up and down uh, the line of Offers Dyke. Uh, looking at heritage, time, <coughs> local community group conferences, uh, um, all manner of stuff there. So a real vibrant environment for doing this work. Now we must think about some of the new projects and initiatives and what they've achieved for the monument because um, as we've seen there's very little that's been written about it and even Keith Ray and Ian Baptist's brand new book Offers Dyke Landscape and Hegemony in 8th Century Britain um, only 
cursorily deals with Watts Dyke in relation to what how it differs from Offers Dyke rather than on its own. Um, we hope to build a research agenda and foster fieldwork projects as well as some community archaeology if we can. Um, and but the main priority is to, is to have fresh perspectives and synergies on this topic. And a key moment in the recognition of Watts Dyke linked to this is the fact that the Office Dyke Association has now changed its charitable, charitable aims to incorporate recognition and care for Watts Dyke. But how do we get people interested in the story? Well, I don't think necessarily a single set of heritage boards, even if they are positioned where you can see the monument, which isn't often the case, um, and you know containing up-to-date information wouldn't necessarily be sufficient. John G. Swagger, who I've worked with, did a comic on of Watts Dyke, um, about Watts Dyke, as part of his Oswestry Heritage Comment Comics book, um, which is packed full of local history, local conservation, and local um, archaeology as told through a four-pane cartoon. And he did one for Offers Dyke, showing you Oswestry, uh, what's Dyke, showing Oswestry as the border and a mythical figure who's given his name to the um, earthwork. And so I've selected a series of locations to work with uh, John G. Swagger to create a new resource to engage people out in the landscape. But given that, frankly, there's so little material coming from Offers Dyke, you know, there's not much to put in a museum. Now, it can, I can show you two examples of here um, from my, my work with John as a pilot study um, uh, in the town of Wrexham um, and to identify points where people can access it to get and get different stories. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and then eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen. Fifteen sites are uh, north of Wrexham, in Wrexham, and south of Wrexham, where a massive um, um, population, um, a huge population compared with the rural site, have. What's like on their doorsteps in not necessarily the best preserved uh, case and, and format, but um, there's me, but according to John, <laughs> um, the, his plan is that we actually work to create a new comic, a new comic um, trying to explain different aspects of what's like. We're also producing an academic journal, number, uh, number one for 2019 came out late last year and it's open access so office journal volume one has uh, two really important articles dealing with offers dyke and what's dyke and the relationship between the two and in addition to that we've got a forthcoming book from the fourth university of chester archaeology student conference called public archaeology of frontiers and borderlands and you can um, buy that from archipress or download for free from Archive Press. And volume two of the Office Giant Journal is coming out very soon. I've just got to write the introduction and then that will all be sorted. So my point is that we have a, an opportunity to do really interesting work on Watts Dyke, um, getting beyond the standard heritage board or interpretation panel to access those communities who are passionate about um, thinking about about archaeology and, and linear earthworks and thinking about the ways in which we can create resources online as well as real world events to supplement that appreciation and understanding and perhaps open it up to new groups and to new perspectives as we move forward. <clears throat> so I hope that second shorter video gives you a flavour of um, my research interest in Watts Dyke. I've reviewed what Watts Dyke might have actually been and I've given you some hinters as to what are the challenges for public archaeology moving forward and how are we going to do that? Well, we are going to continue to develop a website, a journal, events when available and field visits to report on the blog. Uh, so there's a lot of resources you know, accumulating about this enigmatic, strange, poorly preserved in some ways, but striking in other ways ancient monument. Thank you for your time and I hope this proves the basis of a, a fruitful discussion at the, lo um, the Holt Local History Society. So thanks again. If you enjoyed this video please consider subscribing to Howard Williams on YouTube. In addition consider following the Archaeodeath WordPress blog at howardwilliamsblog.wordpress.com